Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Ann Thompson. I am a correspondent for NBC News and a very proud alumna of the University of Notre Dame. And tonight, I am very pleased to be your moderator for this discussion. This is the fifth session in our Bridging the Divide speaker series hosted by the Provost Office at Notre Dame in partnership with the CLOW Center for Civil and Human Rights and the Rooney Center for the Study of American Democracy. The aim of this series is to promote thoughtful conversation on the important issues as we approach November 3rd, the presidential election, which is now less than two weeks away. Regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum, I hope that we can all agree on the need to respect the opinions of others and if we are going to have meaningful conversations about issues that divide this nation and that can move this nation forward. We are living in unprecedented times. We are dealing with a pandemic, deep divisions, both racially and politically, and a presidential election that is almost certain to be contested no matter who wins. Now more than ever is a time for us to wrestle with these issues, but to do so respectfully and with an open mind. Our subject of this session, which is co-sponsored with the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study, is trust, something that is increasingly lacking in our society and most of all in our nation's institutions. Joining me for this conversation is former South Bend mayor and presidential candidate, Pete Buttigieg, better known to most of us as Mayor Pete. He is now a fellow at the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Studies, where he recently completed a book. And here is that book. It is entitled Trust, America's best chance. Throughout our conversation, we welcome you to submit questions for us using the tab on the Think ND page. Mayor Pete, thanks for joining us. Thanks for uh, the chance to be together. I've been looking forward to this and uh, great to be connecting with the, uh, the Notre Dame world in, uh, in a whole new way tonight. So how are you holding up during the pandemic? Well, you know, uh, we're, uh, we're fortunate. Uh, everyone close to me is, is healthy. And uh, I'm also uh, loving uh, the experience of, uh, of teaching and, and being involved at the uh, Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, so in addition to a lot of political work, which is, of course, uh, accelerating as we get into the home stretch here, uh, I've been uh, having a chance to think longer thoughts than you usually get to uh, when you're in political life. Uh, you know, uh, the, the experience of coming off a presidential campaign is a strange one, I'm sure, for anyone. But in, in my case, coincided almost exactly with the beginning of the lockdowns. Uh, that, that started within a week or two of the campaign ending. And so it uh, obviously blew up our, our plans for uh, vacation. But, but it also meant that it, it compelled Chaston and me to sit still uh, and be here at home in South Bend. Uh, and that, that might have uh, uh, been uh, as terrible as the circumstance was. It might have brought some, uh, some blessings with it. So uh, uh, doing my best to uh, uh, balance all of that, even as more in-person travel is starting to resume as, as part of the campaign. Mm -hmm. You may be off the presidential campaign trail, but you certainly aren't out of the public eye. In fact, I see you on TV an awful lot, and most of all on Fox News. So my question is, how did you become the go-to progressive for Fox News? You know, I, I really think it's one of the areas where I, I have the most to contribute when uh, going on TV. Uh, to be clear, you know, we'll go on all, all, all the different cable networks. And, and I also really enjoyed local TV appearances, especially in swing states as a surrogate. Um, what, what struck me as interesting is that uh, it's the Fox News appearances that get the most attention even though I'm not saying anything particularly different than, than I would if I were on CNN or MSNBC or PBS or, uh, or any of the networks. And uh, I think what makes it different is a little bit of tension on the string because I know that uh, uh, the, the hosts and perhaps the viewers I'm speaking to view things very differently. But uh, one of the reasons that, that I think it's important to accept those invitations is that uh, even if I'm skeptical sometimes of the good faith of uh, certainly the opinion hosts on that network, I also know that viewers are turning it, tuning in in good faith, and uh, I can hardly blame them for not being attuned to, to, to my views or our message if they've literally never heard it. And the best way I can think of to do something about that is to go on there and, and, and state my case. 
You know, what you're doing, I think, is so important. David Campbell, who is the director of the Rooney Center four years ago, when I did a panel similar to this, um, talked about how he's a Canadian and he looks at American politics and thinks that we don't talk to each other anymore, mm -hmm. that we are all entrenched in our own little corners. And when we do talk to each other, we shout past each other. And that's, he thinks one of his theories is that's led to the decline in the civility in American politics. Do you find the same thing? I think there's a lot of that. And it's certainly been amplified by what's going on with uh, digital media. You know, uh, there's not a lot of persuasion going on on a place like Twitter, for example. The, the algorithm rewards people who uh, powerfully state something you, you, you agree with or um, powerfully disagree with somebody else in, in a way that, that gets your attention. Uh, in fact, there was a body of research done uh, analyzing a bunch of different modes to see which were most likely to go viral or get clicks. And the one called uh, indignant disagreement turned out to be the one that, that uh, uh, routinely gets the most response. So. You know, there's a way in which this is being rewarded by uh, these algorithms, but of course the algorithms are just going off the human mind. So this is also being rewarded, I think, by maybe a lower order set of preferences that we carry around that may not be our deepest desire as citizens, but is the instantaneous desire that guides our thumbs to, to, to uh, click in ways that computers record and then repeat back out to us. The other thing that I'm worried about, and I, I write this uh, a little bit in the book, is that uh, we're losing some of the overlapping circles of belonging uh, that are so important for us to cut across these divides. And what I mean by that is, you know, I may not belong to your political party, but we belong to the same church. And, and so we know something about each other or we don't belong to the same church, but we belong to the same soccer league and, and we encounter each other there. Uh, and so a religious or political difference is easier to navigate. Um, and uh, people who uh, aren't part of the same uh, sports preference are in terms of what they play, are in terms of what they're a fan of, stuff like that. And yet now what we're finding is those circles that we count on to overlap, to bring us together, even something like our physical neighborhood, um, are increasingly becoming concentric. In other words, if you know where I live or where I went to school or what I do for a living, uh, it's actually relatively easy to predict what my political preference will be in a way that just wasn't nearly as likely to be true a generation or two ago. And that sorting uh, that, that makes so many of our attributes uh, uh, sort of uh, bundled with one another does pose, I think, a great danger to our ability to understand one another as we get uh, uh, sorted into these different buckets uh, that speak to much more than just our political identity. Our what is driving that sorting? Are we doing it? Is the media doing it? Is there some greater force at work here? Well, I do think that, that media and especially digital media have accelerated that. Uh, I think there's also uh, maybe some missed opportunities that we should pay more attention to to get out of our uh, usual circles. Uh, and uh, as mayor, it won't surprise you to hear that I believe a lot of the salvation will come from the local, the idea of the neighborhood, the idea of the community, whether you're in a small uh, town or, or, or a big city, uh, any place where you need to jostle uh, uh, with people who uh, uh, just are, are different than you. Unfortunately, it's made that much harder by the pandemic restrictions, uh, which uh, make us more likely to uh, uh, be associated with those we choose to be associated with. Um, than those we were put next to each other with. But I, I think there are some solutions to that too. You know, we entitled this discussion, Rebuilding Trust in Our Institutions. And obviously the media is one institution where there is not a lot of trust. And we have a question from Littleton, Colorado, who asked, and this person asked, how do you build trust across America when the media, thus the information citizens receive is so clearly biased and agenda driven? How do you answer that? Well, one thing I think we've got to do is pay closer attention to the sources of information that are coming our way and decide uh, whether uh, those sources are credible. I actually think it's fine for a source to have a strong ideological view as long as they're transparent about it. In fact, we might learn a little bit from the media culture in a place like the UK. Uh, where you have a little bit less of the distinction between the editorial and the newsroom views. Uh, newspapers are transparently left, right, or center there. Uh, and while that causes its own issues, it, it also means that you kind of know what you're getting. 
uh, I think that people struggle here sometimes to, to see the earmarks of, uh, of these sources, especially again, in that digital environment. At the same time, I think sometimes it's, it's a little too fashionable to uh, discredit uh, what uh, uh, media sources are doing. There's a lot of good faith uh, that goes into the decisions that uh, journalists make, trying to make sure that they not only present information, but uh, give the reader or the viewer uh, a better sense of how credible that information is, because there is also something uh, very uh, unhealthy uh, about, for example, uh, presenting as 50-50, something that isn't. Uh, we see, saw this a lot with climate, even as the scientific consensus approached 99%. Uh, newsrooms trying to do the right thing uh, wound up presenting it in, in a 50-50 way by having uh, uh, two people uh, uh, to, to spar on a debate show even though one person spoke for 99% of scientists. Uh, we're seeing that in other uh, uh, areas of, of policy debate, I think right now. And so we, we've got to resist the uh, urge to assume that if, uh, uh, if you're presenting two sides, um, that makes it fair. Uh, partly because the credibility of those two sides still needs to be discussed and partly because uh, we shouldn't assume that two is the right number of sides on so many of the important issues that we face. Yeah, we always said there aren't just two sides to a story. There are, if there are 360 degrees in that circle, there are 360 exactly. sides to a story. In your book, you write about trust and you say that trust often unseen is indispensable for a healthy functioning society. And that in the absence of trust, nothing that works can work well. Is a lack of trust at the heart of our nation's problems today? I think in many ways it is. Uh, we don't even think about uh, just how much we rely on uh, literally millions of patterns of, of trust that define our daily lives. Uh, you know, one of the stories I open with in the book is about an encounter I had in Afghanistan when I was deployed there um, and uh, was in a crowded area driving a vehicle uh, where my whole job was just to get from point A to point B and make sure my, my passenger got there uh, alive uh, and, and, and that I did too. Uh, and somebody approached the vehicle in a way that uh, seemed like it might have been consistent uh, with somebody placing uh, an explosive device. And I had about two seconds to decide whether I could trust that person's intentions as he approached my vehicle out of nowhere or whether to level my weapon at him and get out and potentially make the situation even more dangerous. Turned out that, that uh, he, he had a, a perfectly peaceable intentions. Uh, but I didn't have much time to figure that out. And yet, as I was reflecting on that experience, uh, that you know, in a war zone, you've got to trust your life to strangers just to go, go down the street. I realized at a certain point, all of us do that. Uh, if I'm uh, driving up 933 on the way to Notre Dame and I go through a green light, my life depends on whether I can trust the person waiting at Angela to be uh, complying with the red light. Um, and there are un unspeakably multiplying uh, ways in which the, the just basic ability to navigate through the world or to live among other people depends on trust. When that starts to break down, a lot of things break down with it. And I think we've got a threefold crisis of trust right now. Political trust, uh, reported trust, measurable trust in institutions uh, has fallen dramatically in my lifetime. Social trust, the extent to which we trust each other uh, just as, as human beings. And international trust, specifically the trust that other countries place in the United States as a whole. And all three of these are areas I think we've got to recover quickly in order to face the biggest issues of our day because the biggest issues of our day uh, are exquisitely dependent on cooperation if we want to solve them. And cooperation, of course, can't happen without trust. Yeah, and it, when we look at the biggest crisis that this country is facing right now, it is the coronavirus pandemic. And you say in the book that one of the comorbidities, if I could speak, um, of the pandemic is this lack of trust. And I think you can see it in, as you say, in all three areas. We're told we, can't, we have to social distance, we have to wear a mask, so that creates distrust among neighbors, among people. We have seen the political politicization of science, um, which we normally would trust during a pandemic. And now Americans are not welcome in many countries around the world. So if trust is at the heart of this problem, how do we get out of it? Well, you're right that this is central to our ability to confront the pandemic. And unfortunately, 
uh, in the US in particular, there's a generalized and growing mistrust of expertise. Something that's incredibly dangerous if lives depend on whether people, for example, trust experts urging us to wear masks or comply with other public self, uh, safety and health guidelines. But we also know that when there is a spirit of a common project, there is an opportunity to build trust in a hurry. It's something that I certainly observed in the military, but there are also international examples of how this can be done. You know, the US earned a century worth of trust in about three or four years in the way that the US rose to the challenge of World War II and the actions of the US immediately afterwards, uh, helping secure relationships and a level of credibility that might otherwise have taken generations to establish. I think that's not a, a bad metaphor or comparison for where we are now, where internationally, the US could help rally uh, uh, other countries to deal with this pandemic. Of course, to do that convincingly, we'd have to get our own house in order first, uh, but it would make a huge difference if we did. And also at home, you know, the best leaders I see, uh, uh, often mayors or governors uh, acting in the absence of uh, clear guidance from, from the White House, are stepping forward to uh, get things done in their communities and uh, urge people above and beyond just uh, what somebody might uh, or might not take seriously from, from a doctor, uh, making sure that communities as a whole are, are uh, responding to this need. We've got to accelerate that process and quickly. Uh, there's not a lot of time, certainly in, in getting ahead of what could be the very worst uh, to face us in the, in the context of the pandemic but also many other issues that I think the pandemic is a, a lesson for, uh, not least of which is climate change. Another example of an unseen but uh, clear threat, one that is global in its nature, one that will require cooperation to confront, uh, and one that largely depends on our willingness to take seriously the warnings of the scientific community, even if it entails some kind of short-term inconvenience or cost. Following up on that, we have a question from Mishawaka, and it, it, uh, the person asked this, how can whoever is elected to the presidency rebuild the relationship between the government and the scientific community? As a research institution, it is frustrating that the government isn't looking to experts, including those at Notre Dame. As scientists, is there anything we can do to rebuild the trust between us and the public, such as non-maskers? Mm. So you know, scientists, I think, are in a very challenging position here, precisely because of the uh, humility that's required of good science, uh, reporting your own uh, mistakes or exceptions, uh, changing uh, your findings when the facts change. These are the sorts of things that good scientists do that are deserving of greater credibility, but uh, kinds of things position, uh, politicians avoid doing uh, because they can easily be twisted into a way to break down trust. And I think that's part of what we see now. Take, for example, the fact that in the first few weeks of the pandemic, uh, some of the guidance we got from uh, public health leaders was uh, uh, that you know they, they were concerned with making sure masks were mostly available for medical professionals and were not encouraging us to wear masks. Then later on, they were. All of this was above board and explainable, uh, but uh, has now been used as a way to cast doubt on their credibility. Add to that the fact that scientists uh, and in a parallel process, uh, an intelligence community that's also responsible for uh, trying to render uh, in ambiguous situations, trying to render uh, good information, uh, coming under huge political pressure uh, to uh, do or say things that are maybe uh, more helpful to the, the political objectives of the administration, but not actually helpful to their mission. I think fidelity to mission is the most important thing. Transparency about assumptions uh, and about setbacks or reversals. Again, things that are intrinsic to the culture, I think, of scientific inquiry. And then alongside that, a kind of humility, uh, because uh, you know, if we do, uh, I think, take anything seriously about some of the hostility that's arisen toward experts, it's a sense that maybe uh, uh, scientific or other technical experts uh, are sometimes uh, offering solutions to what are really moral or uh, normative questions that are different than, than what they're uh, uh, really expected to be to be researching. And it's one thing to say, uh, uh, this will be the cost of not doing something. It's another to say that these values matter more than those values, which is really what we come together and negotiate in the political space. And I think there's, there's an extent to which we're still figuring that out. But honestly, my advice is mostly not to the scientific community about needing to do things differently. Uh, I think it's the, it's the political space that needs to back off uh, and allow the scientific community to 
render as faithfully as possible what you're learning and support that inquiry and research. Uh, and then make clear that, that this may lead to social or political decisions based on the, the better glimpses of the truth that you're offering. You know, I'm going to paraphrase Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan, who's a Notre Dame law grad, and he says that, it, you know, when we look at what's going on in, in the country regarding the pandemic, if we solve the public health problem, we solve the economic crisis that we're in. And often yes. this is um, portrayed as a false choice instead of if you, you know, solve one problem, you solve the other. Do you see it that way as well? Yes, I think it was Austin Goolsby, who uh, is an economic advisor who uh, uh, I got to know uh, really well in the course of my campaign and, uh, and was an advisor to President Obama. And, and he uh, made the same point in, a, um, uh, in an even blunter way. He said that the first rule of virus economics is uh, if you don't beat the virus, the economics won't get any better. Uh, so it's a classic example. And again, I think this mirrors what's happening with climate, uh, where there may be some perceived short-term gain to downplaying the risk. Um, but really, many of the greatest harms of allowing the, the problem to grow are economic as well as human. And uh, it, it's a false choice to believe that uh, simply wishing away the problem is somehow economically helpful. In your book, you call the crisis of trust a genuine and historic emergency. How concerned are you that whenever we finally know the outcome of the presidential election, there is going to be a significant portion of this country that feels disenfranchised, that may feel that the system has let them down again. They may even wonder if Vladimir Putin has put his finger on our electoral scale. Do you see, do you think we are at a tipping point where we could become an even more divided country, no matter who wins? Well, I think that depends on leadership. Uh, you know, the, the job of uh, a president, like the job of a mayor, is to bring people together. Uh, we, we haven't had much of that in the last four years, but we could. And, and uh, I think that uh, certainly the, the, uh, the instinct of someone like Joe Biden is to uh, heal and to speak even to those who didn't support him. Uh, but the reality is this is a, a deeper social issue than any one presidential candidate or, or party. It's been building up for some time. And I think what really makes it possible is the general atmosphere of policy failure uh, that uh, is especially uh, forming the worldview of younger people who've known nothing else. Uh, you know, I, I, I speak to students who were born sometimes right around the time of 9-11. Uh, and so their entire conscious lives uh, have been characterized by things like the financial crisis, um, the uh, forever wars, uh, and now the, the failed response to the pandemic, as well as the, the uh, consistent racial and economic injustice we've seen. And I actually think that, uh, well, of course, uh, my views, unsurprisingly, are that um, uh, there are a lot of policies that I identify with and that I think my party is offering that can help with each of those problems. The reality is that, uh, the, the current president, I think, was also propelled to power, partly because of a cynicism that resulted from an awareness of that general sense of policy failure in our country that really stretches back, uh, in my view, uh, 30 or 40 years, where uh, we, we've seen as, as presidents have come and gone, inequality grow deeper. Uh, the U.S. fall behind other developed countries on measures of well-being, uh, health, uh, education, social mobility. Um, and this leads to a, a profound sense of distrust that is then amplified uh, by sometimes very cynical actors working to undermine our trust in the system. Uh, Russian disinformation, uh, of course, in 2016 uh, was uh, used uh, for their objective of, uh, of helping uh, President Trump win the, the election. But just to be clear, uh, the fundamental Russian interest is not in one party succeeding. It's in the overall system uh, failing, and they will continue to act in ways, and other foreign adversaries will too, that, that uh, pit us against each other or undermine credibility. One thing that is very sensitive and very important right now is that there, are, there is a lot of uh, activity uh, that amounts to voter suppression going on in a lot of places. Uh, uh, decisions that systematically make it harder, uh, almost always for uh, people of color and or younger people and or poorer people to vote. Uh, relative to other voters. And uh, one trick bag that I think we're in is that we've got to sound the alarm anytime that's happening and respond to it with an insistence that every 
eligible citizen be able to vote and that uh, obstacles to that be minimized. And on the other hand, while expressing justified skepticism in that going on, um, not play into a desire by some to undercut the legitimacy of elections themselves. Something that I'm especially worried that those who lose elections might do uh, uh, after the results in, in November are known in a way that has far more profound implications for our democracy itself than it does for any individual political project or party. You know, I am, I am struck among my friend group um, how determined people are this time around to make sure their vote counts. And I, I have two friends in particular who are on opposite ends of the political spectrum and they both are voting by mail and they both took their ballots, not to their local post office, but they found the main post office in the city where they live, which they hadn't been in in years, and put, put the ballot in the slot to make sure it got there. The idea that we can't count on the post office to help us do something as important as vote, is that sort of the nadir of trust in America these days? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if we're not confident in the post office, we're really in trouble. And uh, to be clear, the post office, uh, uh, the, you know, those who work there haven't done anything wrong, but certainly we saw these, uh, these efforts to, uh, to change what's going on there that diminished uh, uh, confidence because uh, uh, processing times grew and, and it was really frustrating. Um, and, you know, th this, this should be basic, this should be fundamental. Uh, we're, we're starting to have to consider the sorts of things that uh, Americans have often observed in developing countries as measures of how those countries are doing. You know, how's it going with the post office? How are you doing controlling the spread of disease? What's the likelihood of political violence in your country? These are questions we're asking about America that Americans are used to asking uh, about countries in the developing world. And, and it tells you just how much trouble we're in. Now, uh, uh, one interesting thing about voting is, you know, when it comes to members of Congress or members of the Senate, part of how we make sure their votes have integrity is we make them uh, say them out loud, right? The, the, we know how each member voted on each bill. It goes literally up on a big board. Interestingly, part of how we make sure our votes have integrity is we do the reverse, the system of the secret ballot, which we believe uh, uh, makes each voter freer to uh, go into the privacy of that uh, ballot box or, or that envelope. Uh, and make their preference known uh, anonymously. Um, that I think does uh, uh, help assure the integrity of the system, but it does have one cost, which is uh, of course, if there were a big board where you could see everybody and how they voted, uh, then there would be no question over whether every, uh, everybody's uh, vote was registered correctly because you could go check. We do though have a system for telling whether each voter voted. And it's worth noting, especially when you hear these bizarre and spurious uh, claims of, of uh, widespread voter fraud that have never, uh, you know, been examined repeatedly and, and, and uh, never been proven. Um, that, you know, both parties can check on the exact number uh, down to the individual voter, whether they pulled a ballot or not. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why documented uh, voter fraud is so low. Uh, what we are seeing, though, is cases where people are disenfranchised. There's something called disenfranchisement by typo, uh, where if, if you have a hyphen that looks different on your uh, voter card than it does in the system, uh, your ballot might not get counted, things like that, that we need to be very vigilant about. And the general awareness of problems in that area, I think does have people wondering what steps they can take, uh, whether it's uh, uh, which post office they go to, or, uh, you know, my mom did a mail-in uh, ballot, but but hand delivered it. Uh, you know, we're voting at the county city building, largely because we like to go in and vote together. But then I got to stand in line uh, because, uh, Interestingly, no excuse uh, absentee voting. Just to give you one example of how the system is a little uh, skewed. Um, if you're 65 and over, you have no excuse uh, absentee uh, voting. But if you're under 65, you're out of luck on that front. You spoke earlier about inequality in America. And we have a question from Edison, New Jersey. And this person asks, how can trust be created between highly educated and less educated Americans if there is a sense of resentment? And how can the influence of conspiracy theories be stopped in, and instead increase trust in experts? It's a great question. And uh, you know, Michael Sandel has a new book out, uh, which uh, we in South Bend got a, a wonderful preview of about a year and a half ago when he came and gave uh, lectures here at Notre Dame that, that were part of what evolved into the book. And it's about how our highest ideals of meritocracy 
have actually created a real problem. And, and the thought goes like this. Uh, even if we were perfectly meritocratic, in other words, the best seats at the best universities leading to the best jobs and the best paychecks and the most prestige, always went to the person who was the most deserving, the most intelligent, the most capable, the most skilled. Uh, and that is our ideal of meritocracy, however imperfectly we approach it. Well, even if we did that, one of the results would be this sense, and I think it's happening, uh, among uh, people who get those most coveted uh, stations in life, that they're very deserving uh, and, and therefore deserve uh, uh, to be there in a way that makes them a little better than everybody else. Even if it's based on something uh, God-given rather than self-created, like intelligence. Uh, which uh, we may work hard to cultivate, but uh, is also, uh, you know, an example of something that doesn't really have a lot of moral weight in terms of determining whether anybody's more worthy than anybody else. So this creates an environment in which there is a formula for more and more resentment, uh, what Sandel calls morally unattractive attitudes among those who've made it, uh, and a predictable resentment among those who are less educated. By the way, bias against the less educated uh, being perhaps the most socially acceptable remaining form uh, of bias, a kind of casual social bias uh, that we have uh, in, in many parts of this country. And this leads to that resentment and suspicion of anything that appears to be uh, a quote unquote establishment, which is a, a poorly defined term. Um, but, uh, uh, but I think we know kind of the general feel, right? When we talk about that, uh, that in turn, I think uh, is, um, especially today with the economic inequality that it represents, a formula for distrust and resentment. And I do think it's one reason why conspiracy theories are thriving. Now, to be clear, and I mentioned this in the book too, there's nothing new about conspiracy theories. You can go all the way back to 18th century theories about the Illuminati that aren't that different from what you might see on Twitter today. What's new though, is for them to have as much traction and purchase and support from uh, people in positions of responsibility all the way up to the American presidency. And it's no surprise when that president is somebody who arrived largely coasting a wave of that resentment we've been talking about. Um, it might seem ironic, and it is, for somebody who lives in a building in Manhattan with his name on it, who uh, has been photographed with every major uh, political figure of the last 30 years to be the, uh, uh, the champion of uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, the populists, but uh, he's cleverly caught that energy. And I think that's a big part of how we've come to be where we are. You, and to follow up on, on that idea, um, you spoke, we spoke about the inequality in America between those who are highly educated and those who are less educated. We have a question from Bellevue, Belleville, New Jersey, and I apologize for that, about people who are engaged in politics and people who aren't. And the question is, as we see politics become increasingly polarized, what do you believe can be done to bridge the gap between parties and re-engage otherwise disenfranchised Americans in our nation's politics and institutions? Well, I think we need to begin by creating more shared experiences that aren't sorted according to politics. Uh, this is one of the reasons cities and excuse me, and towns are so important. So are universities, spaces that uh, bring people together from radically different backgrounds, uh, at least a university that does a good job of, of, of uh, creating that sense of diversity. This is why I'm a big believer in service. Uh, and I know the military service isn't for everybody, but when I think about the fact that in the military, I learned to trust my life to people who were radically different than me in, in their politics or, or uh, economic or racial or regional backgrounds. I think that could be a model for what we could get out of greater participation in civilian service. And if we fully funded it, uh, we know from the acceptance rates that things like AmeriCorps and the Peace Corps, as well as the military itself, that for every person who gets a chance to serve, there are several who would uh, if, uh, if they only had the opportunity. That means if we're willing to fund it, uh, and uh, there are lots of projects worthy to be done in a, a stepped up national service effort from climate related projects to community health projects for dealing with addiction in communities, uh, whether they're facing the opioid uh, crisis or other related issues or so many other things that could be done. We not only have a chance to do important work, but we have a chance in that process to build up social bonds among people who will go through the rest of their lives. Having had that baseline of experience uh, connecting with other Americans, uh, that will be a touchstone and a conversation starter and a, a, a basic uh, shared reality 
uh, that helps us cut across some of these things that make it feel like even our realities are different. The other thing we got to do is that our institutions need to be more trustworthy. Uh, that's especially true in terms of the way they uh, have treated different Americans differently. Uh, the Black experience, uh, for example, uh, is obviously one where uh, some of the institutions where trust is most important, from policing to the financial system, uh, has uh, not been uh, equal in terms of access to that trust or, or even safety. Um, we also need reforms, in my view, good political reforms that will make our institutions more responsive to Americans, because again, uh, uh, it's benefited uh, either party in different ways sometimes, and I think has helped us lead at the moment to those who are currently in power. But that experience of uh, seeing your preferences consistently defeated, seeing the preferences of the American majority consistently defeated in Washington, I think builds to a general sense of wanting to burn the house down uh, that can uh, badly damage both parties. It's damaged uh, my party because uh, we lost as a result of it. And I think it's damaged the Republican Party because they experienced a hostile takeover uh, by somebody channeling that energy. Back to the idea of service, do you think there should be mandatory service in the US? I don't think it's uh, going to be in keeping with our American way to make it mandatory, but I'm not sure that you have to uh, when you consider uh, what a uh, an expanding voluntary program would do. What I would envision is, first of all, making sure it's paid so that uh, service isn't a luxury. Often the idea of a gap year to serve or volunteer seems wonderful, but not everybody actually can, can do it uh, given their, their economic limitations. So we actually got to pay. Uh, it doesn't have to be lavish, but it has to be adequate. Uh, and I think if we made it widespread enough, we could make it into a kind of social norm. So, you know, whether you're headed to university or, or right into the workforce, it would be enough of a, a norm for young people, for example, that uh, on your college application or on your first job application, first question you would expect to get is, what was your service here like? Where did you serve? What did you learn? And the more that's true, the more it just gets kind of baked into just what we do. Uh, I, I think that's probably more realistic than trying to mandate it. Uh, but I think in the long run is no less likely to lead to an almost universal culture of service. Yeah, in the same way that internships have now become the um, currency for college graduates looking for that first job, maybe service could become that currency. I think so. Yeah. And again, we should fund it so that that currency is available to everybody. You, you mentioned also the Black experience, and in your book, um, you talk about two ways to, to help restore trust in America. One is a fairer tax system, but the other idea you have is restorative justice. And you talked about, you, know, per, you raised the idea of, the, of truth and reconciliation commissions, much like they did in South Africa after apartheid fell. Is, is that something you think we need in America? Is it realistic? And how? what kind of form would that take? I think we do need to explore this. Uh, the, uh, these models aren't perfect, but what was done with the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa established a reality that couldn't be denied, even from people who had had radically different experiences. And uh, while many Americans might be uh, uh, startled by the idea that uh, a model from, from there could make sense here. You know, we are a war-torn country. Uh, we haven't fully recovered from the Civil War. If we had, uh, taking down Confederate battle monuments wouldn't be uh, so contentious. And there are North American precedents for this too. Canada, for example, had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, who, uh, that, that looked into the way that indigenous uh, Canadians uh, or, or indigenous people uh, who came to, to live under the Canadian system were, were treated. And uh, to get through uh, so many of the, uh, the things that have happened in this country, especially when it comes to racial injustice, I think we need to go through a process of truth telling that allows us to stand on a common field of fact. Uh, Member of Congress Barbara Lee has uh, laid out a fairly specific proposal for how this might be done in the United States. And uh, you know, there's a lot of power in uh, forms of, of restorative justice versus retributive justice and a lot of different models out there that we might learn from. Again, none of them are perfect, uh, but uh, many of them are instructive. One of my colleagues at, uh, at the Institute for Advanced Study is looking at the reintegration of people in Rwandan communities who were convicted of genocide. Uh, and this is, of course, within uh, our, our lifetimes. Uh, now, in some cases, uh, obviously not without complication, but in ways we might learn from. 
being, uh, 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 being reintegrated into their communities. If there's a way to do that there, surely, um, by being more imaginative about the models we apply in the United States, we might have a better track record on healing uh, racial injustice than we've had these last 400 some years. I know you like to think a lot about the structure of the American government and changes you would like to see. And we have a question from Dayton, Maryland that says, if you could change the constitution, what is the one thing you would add, delete or change to affect a more civil discourse within the, the American political system? Mm, interesting. Um, can, you make it, can you make it an amendment to the constitution that we all be more civil? <laughs> well, it, you know, it's hard to pick just one. I think a, a package of amendments might be due. I mentioned in the book that, you know, as a country, we've generated substantive amendments to the constitution at a pace of roughly one per decade. Um, but with the exception of one very technical one, we haven't really done much in the last 50 years. And by the way, the last time we did, uh, Birch Bayh, senator from Indiana, hardly a wild-eyed radical, was leading the charge on things like uh, lowering the voting age to 18, which required an amendment, uh, the 25th, uh, which is important for uh, presidential succession issues. Even uh, amendments that didn't make it, like the ERA, led to a lot of good things like the emergence of Title IX. Uh, and for, for what it's worth, I think the ERA still uh, is a, a valid and, and ought to be ratified. So uh, some of the things that we could do going forward, uh, well, certainly uh, something about gerrymandering, right? Remember that, that the very shape, literal shape of our congressional districts makes it that much harder to have a, a balanced and civil community of US members of Congress. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why, you know, the, the community of US mayors, for example, uh, given that the city limits are a little harder to gerrymander, uh, are a much more functioning uh, body of people from both parties and around the country who uh, work together and like each other and get along than often uh, the U.S. House appears to be. Uh, so dealing with gerrymandering, dealing with the role of money in politics, uh, which, uh, because in the wake of Citizens United, probably can't be addressed without a constitutional amendment, uh, is going to be crucially important. Uh, I believe there are a lot of structural considerations uh, that, that matter. Then again, the good news is not all of this requires a constitutional amendment. H.R. Uh, 1 was a piece of House legislation that unfortunately didn't go anywhere in the Senate, but that might be different next year, uh, that was aimed at some of these things. Reforms around gerrymandering, around voting rights, uh, even the introduction of approaches like uh, uh, ranked choice voting or jungle primaries or uh, other things that, that uh, uh, lead to perhaps more balanced and better edu uh, election outcomes. A lot of that can just be done by legislation. We're starting to learn uh, just how many things that we all probably assumed were written in the Constitution uh, are actually either just customary or just the result of laws, even the makeup of the Supreme Court. Uh, the fact that election days are on Tuesday, uh, which, by the way, is mostly so that you could uh, be able to uh, ride your horse into town and, uh, uh, and vote and still be able to get your goods to market by Wednesday, you know, really uh, uh, outdated things. We assume are in the Constitution, even the number 435 for the number of U.S. House of Representatives members. It's not constitutional. It's just a law. And we could update it if we thought it was the right thing to do as a country. Yeah. In fact, the number of justices on the Supreme Court is not in the Constitution. And I know that's something you've thought a lot about. Um, in your presidential campaign, you talked about expanding the Supreme Court. It is an issue that has come up again because of the death of Justice Ginsburg and with the nomination of Judge Barrett. So tell us, what do you think? I, I, let, me, let me ask it this way first. When I think when people today hear it at this moment hear that Democrats want to change the number of justices on the Supreme Court, to many people it sounds like sour grapes. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, you know, you 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 lost you lost. Mitch McConnell had his eye on the ball. He knew what he wanted. He wanted a more conservative Supreme Court, and he is on the edge of achieving that. You, you lost, go home and play by the rules. Is it, is it sour grapes by the Democrats to suggest to expand the Supreme Court? Well, I think it's a response to watching uh, Mitch McConnell break a lot of norms uh, in order to succeed. Um, but I also think that uh, you know, we've got something a little more immediate on our hands uh, in terms of the nomination right now that uh, the majority of Americans believe uh, ought to be made by the winner of this election. But of course the Senate, despite its inability to act on COVID relief, uh, seems to be whipping itself into shape to do this in a hurry, uh, which is problematic. 
Um, but I think reform con conversations are about a lot more than uh, you know, who, who won or which party feels better in any ind individual cycle. This is about what we think our courts and our bench should look like in order to best serve the American people. Um, but beyond that, I mean, it, you know, we talk about trust and when you see people complaining that the now saying that the game isn't fair, and that's a bad analogy, but the, the rules aren't fair because they've lost. Doesn't that erode trust? Well, uh, it, it's a good point. I mean, we should uh, look at when uh, what we need to do is actually challenge uh, something about the system or the way things are done, uh, or whether within that system, we just need to work harder to get a better outcome. I think both are going on right now. Uh, you know, part of the concern is just uh, uh, making sure that we have uh, for example, that people win elections who, who reflect the, what Americans want to see happen. But I do think there's some issues with norms and the rules that we've gotten used to and, and uh, sometimes uh, just allowed to, uh, to get twisted or changed. I mean, you know, the most significant change to the number of Supreme Court justices that took place within my lifetime was when uh, Mitch McConnell's Senate changed it temporarily to eight until they took power again. And uh, you know, these things have consequences for the ability of both sides to feel comfortable about the processes that uh, we're all working within. How would you make the Supreme Court less politicized? Well, I think a lot of things uh, could help do that. Uh, what we know is we can't go on like we are right now, just an uh, ideological death match every time there's a vacancy. You know, justices used to just retire like everybody else. Uh, you didn't used to see this uh, idea of justices trying to uh, sometimes uh, hang on on the bench. Uh, longer than, than, than most people would hang on to any job just to try to time who was in power when they, when they left. Uh, so uh, some people think that term limits are, are worth exploring. I think that cuts both ways, but it deserves a look. There are ideas of a balanced bench. Uh, the way you, you uh, set up the makeup of the court could, uh, could require a greater level of balance or consensus. Uh, there are even ideas about how you'd rotate people on and off the appellate bench uh, rather than allowing a specific small handful of people uh, to be the only ones who weigh in. There are lots of ways we can do it, and, and uh, I continue to think we should explore that, but I don't want us getting uh, so bogged down in that as a kind of political point in the next two weeks, knowing that you know, these are part of a bigger family of structural issues that we should consider uh, as an American people uh, going into the years ahead. And I think this next decade could be a decade of reform, not just on the bench, but what we're doing about our legislative bodies, even the very simple fact that uh, you know, a democratic republic probably ought to give its presidency to the person who gets the most votes. And it wouldn't be a bad idea if everybody's votes counted the same. Uh, to me, this shouldn't be a particularly partisan claim. The idea that we should have a, popular, a national popular vote. As a general rule, most people think it's the right thing to do. Uh, I always thought as a, a you know, when I, certainly when I was learning about the electoral college down the, you know, across the street from the golf course at Notre Dame in, in St. Joe High School, um, it, it crossed my mind that, you know, if I understand this concept of the Electoral College, but if it ever actually overruled the American people, I'm sure uh, we'd never allow that to happen again. That went on to happen twice, just in my lifetime. And uh, we've got to ask ourselves how much longer America can go uh, in, in this kind of counter, uh, counter democratic or anti democratic fashion before things start to break down. I think things are starting to break down around us for this very reason. We've talked a lot about. Um, the lack of trust in our society tonight. Do you see anywhere where trust is flourishing? I certainly think that salvation might come from the local. Uh, I have seen ways in which people uh, have worked across party lines, uh, worked across usual political visions, certainly here in South Bend. One of the things I really valued as mayor was the fact that, you know, with a very contentious uh, 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 local politics, uh, you were never going to burn a bridge with one of your legislative members, in this case a council, because the very same person who was driving you up the wall, uh, blocking some piece of legislation you cared about, two months later might be the swing vote who got your budget through. Uh, it doesn't uh, fall into those same predictable partisan lines that national politics does. I think we can learn a lot from that. I think any community that draws people out of their usual silos or bubbles, again, I think uh, uh, service, military or otherwise, is part of this. Faith communities can do this too. Faith communities are very much about trust. In some languages, uh, there's very little distinction between the, the very idea of faith and of trust. 
And uh, it's something that we should think about uh, and in an area where I think uh, the, the kind of thinking that goes on on both sides of the aisle at a place like Notre Dame is, is very special in that context. Um, faith, of course, can be a source of uh, violent uh, distrust, and disagreement, pain, and, and, and division, but it can also uh, be a way to establish goodwill, both within and across and among faith communities. And this is a good time for us to be exploring how that might be part of the solution. We have a question from Notre Dame that asks, should rebuilding trust start at the individual level or the institutional level? Mm, what a great question. I think that uh, a lot does depend on the individual level. After, after all, we form our earliest and, and deepest understandings of trust in the context of family uh, and friendships, those we love. Uh, it's also worth remembering that interpersonal trust matters because people are flawed. If we all knew exactly what to expect from each other, if we never let each other down, uh, if uh, uh, no one ever uh, broke a promise, well, then trust wouldn't even exist or make sense as a concept. It would be irrelevant. Uh, trust exists. Trust is needed because we're not perfectly reliable. And often uh, the most important experiences we have that relate to trust have to do with what you do when trust has been damaged or sacrificed and needs to be rebuilt. And uh, precisely because we're flawed beings, we learn ways of uh, developing and, and, and restoring trust in our personal lives. That's probably the most powerful playbook that we can draw on when it comes to how our institutions might do the same because uh, our institutions in our country, uh, just like human beings that we love, uh, have sometimes let us down. And we've got to do something about it in a way that on one hand, uh, presses those institutions to do better. And on the other hand, just as with somebody we love, refuses to give up on them or their capacity to change. We have a question regarding your experience as a professor. Um, and this comes from North Potomac and it says, I appreciate your call for a more free exchange of ideas, especially at universities. It seems the trend is in the opposite direction with differing views being silenced or shamed. How do we reverse this? Well, I do think universities are one of the best places for this to happen. And I, one of the things I love about the undergraduate seminar I'm teaching is that there are clearly very different perspectives from one another and, and from mine uh, that, uh, that you hear and, and that challenge us to, to think better. And uh, because we have the advantage of being part of this community, this little community we've created of students in the class and this broader university community, there's a little bit of a down payment on that bit of goodwill or trust that you need in order to negotiate your differences. In other words, uh, in order to have a serious and good faith conversation about where we don't see eye to eye, we need to have something to plant our feet on that's shared. Now, the big question on my mind is how do we, uh, you know, certainly a circle of belonging, like being part of a special uh, uh, community like the University of Notre Dame can do some of that work. How do we draw that circle so wide that it includes uh, all Americans, uh, a circle of belonging that big, uh, big enough that the belonging means something, uh, or I should say maybe small enough <laughs> somehow that the belonging means something and yet big enough uh, to uh, include or accommodate all of us. This is why I, I won't give up on the idea of nationality. And I know among progressives, it's unfashionable to talk about nationality because we've seen how uh, the worst kinds of nationalism are so harmful. But I think a kind of uh, progressive patriotism might be in order that recognizes that it does, can, and should mean something to be American and that our identity, our identification with the American project is actually something that we can use to build uh, uh, some basic, a minimal level of fellow feeling with people who otherwise we have nothing in common with. And it gives us a starting point to then start to hash out the differences and values or in interests that make up uh, the very reason we have a public square to hash that kind of stuff out. So if we want to be part of rebuilding trust in this country, give all of the people who have tuned in tonight three ideas, three things they can tangibly do to help make, Amer to rebuild trust in America's institutions? Well, one would be to venture into spaces uh, where maybe not everybody's aligned with you uh, on a social or political matter, but uh, that uh, you know that you can build some good faith in and then understand different attitudes. Uh, so for me, there's a very specific version of that, which is to go to a place like Fox News, but you don't have to be getting television bookings to uh, think of ways. And I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, you, you, you join the nearest, uh, 
uh, whatever uh, uh, soccer team and then go in and try to pick political arguments. What I mean is uh, think about uh, circles that you have access to, social, neighborhood, family, political, whatever it is, um, and dwell on the way that you can build up a personal connection with people before you get to the things that are different. A second thing that I think is important is looking for forms of service, even uh, before uh, uh, any of the ideas I've talked about for national service could be realized. All of us have opportunities, voluntary uh, or professional, to be better engaged in service, and we should seek out the service experiences that might draw people to serve at our side who are very different from us. And the third I'd say is to support those communities, uh, whether it's literally a community in the sense of a, a local city or town, uh, or a university community or faith community uh, that we know are doing work that can help reinforce trust uh, and find ways to build them up, especially knowing how threatened they are uh, by the physical isolation that has come as a consequence of the pandemic. More than ever, this is an opportunity for us to build those up and it would make a big difference if we did. I know that you are asked this every time you do an interview, so I don't want to disappoint you, but on my Excel spreadsheet here of questions, there are a lot of people who have asked, will you run again for president? The honest answer is that I don't know. Uh, every time I've run for office, it's, it's been by thinking about what the office called for in that moment and what I had to offer in that moment and whether there was a, uh, something unique about the way those two things lined up. And that process has led me to run for office several times. It's led me to not run for office. Several times I was thinking about an opportunity. Uh, I ran for president because I wanted to uh, further a certain set of uh, values, not the other way around. And uh, if I find in the future that, that uh, returning to, uh, to campaigning would be the right thing to do by those lights, then I would. But it's impossible to know what the moments are gonna call for because more than at any other time in our lives, there's so much uncertainty about the road ahead. But what I know is I can make myself useful uh, to the things that I care about and to the country that I care about uh, in a number of ways. And uh, time will have to tell exactly how those ways stack up. So we shouldn't look at trust as a springboard for another run for the White House? <laughs> Hardly, uh, but I do hope that people think about it this election season and beyond because you know, I think these issues, and, and I'm blessed to be part of this amazing community of scholars at the, at the Institute who think about it from every different angle, from computer science to history to anthropology. Um, uh, I think this issue uh, is only going to be more important. I'm so glad it was the chosen theme for the year uh, at the Institute. And I think we'll be talking about trust and the need to fortify trust uh, uh, in a lot of different contexts in the years ahead. Do you see in your students a desire for trust? Do they want to, I mean, kids always want to go out and change the world for the better, but what is it that you see that they're yearning for that makes them unique or different? So I asked my students the other day whether they agreed with my characterization of their generation as more earnest than my own. Uh, I remember, and by the way, I'm still struggling to admit that my generation is a different generation than the generation that's in college right now, but I might as well face up <laughs> that. But when I was in college, well, not that long ago, about 20, right about the time my students were born, um, there was a real atmosphere of irony. Uh, people didn't want to be too closely associated with any uh, cause or identity that could get you made fun of. It was social, not just political or cultural. And that seems to be very different now. I think so many of the uh, tough experiences that, that today's generation of young, youngest people have faced uh, have contributed to a shedding of that kind of irony, which is great because you need to leave it behind to participate in a full-throated way, whether it's in the movement for black lives or uh, in uh, climate activism or in, in a faith community or really in politics itself. Uh, and yet alongside that earnestness, there is also a kind of a cynicism. Uh, and I asked to uh, speak to a young activist today for my podcast and, and, and asked about uh, you know, whether, uh, now to him, interestingly, cynicism doesn't mean not getting involved. Um, but it, it, it was a kind of sense that uh, all they've seen is failure from our institutions. And so it'll be very interesting to see as, as this generation is empowered. Uh, and by the way, we're talking about um, uh, a generation that will just by force of numbers will come to, to gradually dominate our politics uh, and our society. Um, how that combination of uh, deep skepticism, perhaps to the point of cynicism about institutions, with a very earnest desire 
to get things done and to make sure that things are better than what, uh, what they've been handled. Well, Mayor Pete, thank you very, very much for joining us tonight and giving us a lot to think about. And those three ideas you expressed of how we can each start to rebuild trust in this country, get outside our comfort zone, talk to those who don't agree with us, uh, seek out service opportunities, and most importantly, support your community that reinforces trust. I thank you very much. Good luck with the book. And I hope good luck with the class and I hope you'll come back and join us. And we hope the rest of you can join us for the final session in this series, which will happen next Thursday night on October 29th, when Notre Dame students who are members of a group called Bridge ND will host a conversation about civil dialogue and free speech on college campuses. For more information on Bridging the Divide speaker series, please visit provost.nd.edu. Thank you for joining us and as always, go Irish.